We know things are a little tense in Michigan right now, so we have some of Detroit's finest sons here for you today for a little Detroit drummer roundtable. And uh, please welcome Jason Hartless, Ted Nugent's drummer, Greg How's it going? everybody's drummer, Chad Smith, Chili Peppers, and everybody's drummer. And <laughs> welcome, fellas. Welcome. Welcome. Great to be here. Chad, did you remember to wear pants? What? Are you wearing pants? No. That's a reminder. Of course. Hey, hey, hey. You got you to be wearing pants in the, in the stream. Oh, man. why? I'm not going to stand up. We have Greg Bissonette over there with his uh, Casper, Dixon Casper Signature Series drums there. Uh, what's up with that, G? Should I take the Casper the Friendly Ghost thing up? It's just good for like FaceTime lessons. You know? But I'll, I'll take the Casper up here. Show my Sabian symbols, man. Well, it's going to get noisy. Shameless plug for Sabian. Is this a Sabian? Shameless plug for Sabian. Is this, is this Sabian? Is that what we're doing? That's what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Randy there, Jason. Um, are you, Jason, are you in Detroit right now? Yeah, yeah, yep, uh, just outside in Sterling Heights. In Sterling Heights, man. Oh my god, that's, that's, that's there, man. the woods, Greg. You're an east sider, man. Well, Chad, do you remember when we were high schoolers and stuff that we'd always go to that big Sterling Heights movie theater? There was like 100 theaters there on Van Dyke. Remember that? Yeah, you probably live near there, right, Jason? I don't even know if that's still around. <laughs> you know, I have a feeling a lot of the stuff when me and Greg, because Greg and I, we left in Haiti, and I'm sure a lot has changed. And, you know, Detroit was kind of coming back a little bit. And Jason, you could probably tell us better. But, um, and then, and now all this shit happening, you know, it's crazy for everybody. But, um, um, you know, what's the what's the vibe in Detroit, at least from your perspective right now? Are, are, are people scared? Are people hopeful? Is it both? What's going on? Yeah, we're pretty much on a whole lockdown here. You know, I've been I've been in my house for the last month and a half, pretty much, you know, uh, but, you know, hopefully it's it seems to be getting better. And, you know, everybody's very optimistic about, uh, you know, where everything's kind of going. But uh, it got crazy for a minute, especially in the uh, Detroit metro area. Not so much the, the state of Michigan, but, um, you know. It definitely seems that good times are coming. We're getting the OK Boomer here from uh, the boss. Let him have it, Chad. What's that? You look, like, you look like fucking Santa Claus in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> you swear on these things? Is that OK? I don't know. Is OK? Is that a, the F word? I don't really know. It's the interwebs. Boom, ouch, Boomer. Oh. What is it? What, what is that? <laughs> Well, he's really losing it. If you guys were talking about the good old days, yeah, like you know, I was just asking the guys, you know, since Chad and I grew up in Detroit back in the day, I was asking, <laughs> we were asking Jason, who's could probably tell you anything about the Red Wings that, that, that there is, and we're all Red Wings, Lions, Pistons, you know, everything. But the Detroit Tigers, when I was in the fourth grade, our teacher brought in a black and white TV, and we watched the 1968. Detroit Tigers with Denny McLean and Mickey Lulich win the World Series. And then in 84, we were at, Chad and I were asking Jason, there was a Tiger that hit a World Series winning home run. And then he became a Dodger where Chad and I live now. See, I'm representing both. Look at you. Damn, you're good. And, so, and this guy came to a Dodger game that I was at because he was coaching for the Tigers. And he said, who are you going to root for? And I said, both teams. He said, good answer. We asked who won the World Series for LA when he hit a game winning World Series right. home run. And right. Chad and I were asking Jason and Chris, but we didn't get it right out. Who was that? Anybody out there? Kirk. That's right, Timmy Gibson. That guy, right? <laughs> Timmy from Madison Heights, Michigan got that one. Well, and I see my old next door neighbors on Mark Sanger. Oh, that's Mark. A, that's amazing. Oh, there that's he is. Any Andover stories? No. How about the time when I was passed out in the car in the driveway and I was playing the music so loud and you came over and I was just so hung over from a WRIF midday concert with Toby Red. Toby Red, man. Toby Red. What? Toby Red. Anyway, well, I want to ask Jason, what's 
Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Whoa, you got graphics. You mean <laughs> hair? Who's Look that guy? Hair. Look at that. Wow. That's now, some. Chad, right now, Chad, what you don't, what you, Chad, what you don't know is um, down, Aquanet, and then hopefully it's not raining. Now, now, Chad, um, what you don't know is I'm actually the managing partner of the record label that just recently um, signed a deal with you guys, Toby Red, to re-release all of the uh, the old stuff. Wait, what? Yep. <laughs> yeah. I don't so know about this, wait, what? What? Yeah. Really? Tell what? 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 Wait, re-release what? In the light? Yes, sir. <laughs> we were way ahead of our time. Absolutely. Look at that, man. Toby Red. Oh, yeah, I was, talking, I was talking to Tony this morning about uh, you know, getting everything together. Get the fuck out of here. Yep. Really? Can we it, like it was on CBS or or, or RCA or something? Is that okay? Can you? Yeah, we we worked out everything a couple months ago. And who? You and who? Me and You're Tony a and, man. and all the other logistic stuff. You're a bender man. <sighs> Great. Yeah, so that'll be that'll be coming out at the end of this year. Is the vinyl going to be red like the first one? Says Andy. Yes, it Andy, is. Yes. Thank God, Andy, that you're not a man that needs to know how to spell. It looks like vanilla. 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 That's Canadian. That's Canadian for vinyl. <laughs> oh, this is so weird. Ah! Ah! Look at some white castles, man. Jason, bring them out for us. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, my God. Hunter House, that's my place. Yeah. Hey, hey, Chad, tell us about recording the new Ozzy album, man. With Duff McKagan, right? And who yeah, else? yeah, yeah. Yeah, God, it seems so long ago now. We did, a, um, Ozzy was doing um, a guest on a Post Malone song on his last record. And the guy who wrote it and produced it is a good friend of mine I've been working with. His name is Andrew Watt. And he's kind of more of a pop producer, but he's a rock guy at heart. And Ozzy came over to this, to his house, which is where the studio is, and he had a great time. And I played drums on that track. And then um, Ozzy leaves, and his and Kelly, his daughter, brought him over, and she was like almost crying. She was really emotional, and she's like, "I haven't seen my dad that happy." in six months and we're like wow. really she, and we're like i mean it was great ozzy was great he was farting and telling joe you know did not disappoint peeing in the plant yeah. or he was <laughs> it was great and he sang great he sounded great and he and it was just like wow you know ozzy are you kidding me so but he we unbeknownst to us he had taken a fall a really bad fall in early january like over a year ago and was pretty miserable around the house for like the last six months and wasn't getting better, wasn't bouncing back. And so it kind of, you know, rejuvenated him to be making music, doing what he loves. And he didn't know who Post Malone was. Oh, the fucking Postman. That's a good Birmingham accent right there, Jen. <laughs> Birmingham. And he, he, was, he was just wanted to make more music and we're like fuck let's write some songs for Ozzy shit god that great and that's what we did and we got Duff who we both know and I played with recently before that time on some charity events and he was available it just all kind of came together and literally from scratch we had no music but thinking about our favorite Ozzy slash Sabbath type songs I'm um, not trying to recreate that. That's impossible. But to, to, to really kind of what what as fans, we would want to hear Ozzy sing today in a, in a modern setting. And we just wrote 12 and wrote and recorded 12 things in four days. Wow. Like old school. Like old school. Who's getting an idea? Bam, 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 bam. How does this make a good verse? I don't know. Does this go with this part? You guys know. You know, da, 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 da. yeah. And we, it just all kind of came together. And we used nine of those things that we did. Wow. In four days. It was amazing. So wow. 
Well, and yeah, then, we can do that. yeah, so it, it, it's 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 uh, you know, it all worked out, and and you know, we got some other people to play on it, and anybody we asked wanted to do it. Elton John's on a track; he sings and plays piano on on the title track, and Slash does a couple solos. Tom Morello's on it. Um, you know, yeah. So it's it, it was fun, and for me, growing up. Look, it's funny you ask. Yeah, no word. I mean, who, who's not like the hugest? I mean, black Sand, Come on, it's like I was. Well, I noticed the vibe of the, the the tone of the drums, man. Were very like Black Sabbath, uh, just sort of muted and uh, very vintage sounding on that record, with lots of bottom and punch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the main thing, yeah. is, and I think both of you guys know, and you too, Chris, being a drummer as well, is that I just. With heavy music, I wanted it to swing. And Bill Ward, who's my favorite drummer, was such a swinging jazz-influenced drummer like a lot of those English guys. Yeah. And sometimes when people play that heavy, you know, Sabbath-esque music, they think of it as, i got to beat the crap out of it, and, you know. And, it, and I just wanted to make it swing. So... Yeah, man. And then uh, literally two, three takes of a song, and then boom, go on to the next. So that I, it's not, you know, when you're, you're recording, it's like you, you, you're just trying to get the arrangement. You're not thinking about, well, what kind of fill should I do going into the course? You're just like, oh, this goes four times? Oh, okay. uh, you know. And so that stuff makes it, uh, that has that spontaneity in it, and it, it's exciting, and it's performance-based. So that's old school. Yeah, the drums are just, you know, just wanted to get them sounding good and loud and proud and whatever. And Ozzy, where did you Ozzy record, was banging his cane while he was ah! that was a good sign. <laughs> where did you track it at? My friend Andrew has a studio at his house in Beverly Hills. Cool. And so everything's set up all the time. And so that's why it was literally, you know, we're in the basement of his you know, basement studio, and it was literally, you know. We'd come up with some riffs, and Duff's the writer too. And Andrews, we got some ideas, and boom, 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 and then go right to our instruments, play, yeah, work it out, track it. And so we did three things a day, you know, on an afternoon. I mean, it was it was really, it was really fun. But anyway, enough of that. But that, that so both the, Greg and Chad, you both play with Joe Satriani, and I think you both worked with Andy Johns at one point, right? That's right. Yeah. Who you think you're home with? Didn't you stink, you little? So what, what I, I want to know what the secret is with the bottom sound. Everybody knows about the staircase and all that, but that ain't just it. The secret is it's John Bonham. Oh, it's right. That's the secret. I remember the first rehearsal, my brother was playing bass, and Andy's looming, as he does, right, Chet? He's looming over the kit. Well, you like your drums to sound like mate? And I said, how about any of those great tracks you did with John Bonham? He says, we can do that. And we went into Ocean Way. We re the drums with a big PA. He put room mics everywhere. And then he says, we're not using a hole in your bass drum. He took off the front bass drum head. He, he cut a 421 cable, put it in there, dangling, soldered it, put a little piece of foam in there. And he had just recorded Van Halen, too. And he said he had an idea about how Alex Van Halen, who was another one of our heroes, had you know gaffer tape going across his snare. And the first song we did was that song, Friends. And I said, can you make it that kind of sick? He goes, I got you, man. And so we played. And I went in, and it was like that. God, Andy, and just gave these big hugs, and he was just the coolest guy, man. What a great, great guy, and uh, love Andy Johns, man. Yeah, what a legend. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, he. I mean, the sound of of summer song. Oh, that's Andy. Andy right there. Fantastic. Like, like that. That's just like, that's amazing. Um, you know, Chad, yeah, you'll relate to this because you, you know, you and Joe are such great friends. But Joe had the demo for Summer Song with his drum machine going, and the fill, so I played the fill, and I just played it like a, and Joe says, "Could you do it again without the recovery time?" I said, "Recovery time, Joe? What are you talking about?" He goes, "Well, my drum machine goes." 
I said, oh, Joe, he goes, but if drummers don't play that way, it's okay. I said, well, we don't, but I'll sure try. And Joe just said, let's just do it however you want to do it, man, because he, he loved his songs, and he he's one of those guys, as you know, in Chicken Foot and everything, he he knows how to be in a rock band, you know, so he just yeah. said, let's do it the way the drummer would do it, you know. Yeah, well, he's got, you know, he got a studio, and he does get programs drum. I did not his solo album that just came out, which is great, by the way. Um, that Kenny, our buddy Kenny's on. Kenny's on that one, yeah. Yeah, but I did the one before, and he had he sent me all the songs, and they had all you know pr programmed, and you know, and sometimes guys get demoitis and they want to hear it a certain way. As you guys, yeah. and so, but he's, you know, he's smart enough, and he know he's like you know, it's yeah. just an idea, but. But then yeah, the studio and cut him, he'd be like, what does it do on the demo? <laughs> I can, I can, I'd be my own version of that. But anyway, but yeah, uh, Andy Johns, um, you know, legendary for those who don't know, he did, you know, work with the Rolling Stones and, and Exile Main Street when he was a young kid and, and did, you know, a couple, at least, led up on four, but I think he worked on three and maybe some of Physical Graffiti, too. And um, a couple of great Van Halen albums, too. Did Van Halen records and Rod Stewart records. He was, you know, his brother, Glenn, who's, you know, again, another legend. But Andy, Andy was real rock and roll. Glenn was kind of, you know, more English, you know. And yeah. He was a rocker. Yeah. <laughs> Andy was the rocker. Andy was the rocker, and he would, he would go for it. And I don't know, Greg, if you ever saw this, but if you're tracking with them and, and he's liking this, it's, it's groove, and he would do, he'd kind of go like this. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> he'd do that little. Yeah, he'd do the little Andy shimmy like. Oh. And and he's he's not, he's, you know, he's always talking about forward motion. I like this take because it's going right. to yeah. forward motion. Right. Yeah. That's it. It was his locomotion thing. It was the locomotion. Uh, I wish you could have played with Andy. He passed away a few years ago, but you'd love recording with him. You too, Chris. First time I ever played with Chris Stinky, we did a drum clinic together in Grand Rapids. I was so nervous, man. You're a great drummer, Stinky. He is a good drummer. And when I was in Grand Rapids, we used to do clinics in a giant movie theater complex there. And Greg and I were set up on the stage in this movie theater, and they're all soundproof, so we would have drum clinics uh, from the store, written music and firehouse music. I don't know if firehouse yeah. is there, but I know RIT is the work to teach there. But yeah, yeah, Greg made me feel really comfortable. And when the dealer didn't show up afterwards to buy us dinner, Greg bought me dinner. Oh, uh, look at that guy. That one. And we watched, we watched the Red Wings game. And we watched the yeah. Red Wings game. Yeah. Fucking hey, Jason, is the is Harpo's and the Magic Bag in Ferndale, are those still open? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Harpo's not open, open, but still still surviving. Yeah, Harpo's is attempting to make a nice comeback. Problem is the area is just so, so destroyed. That's a <laughs> rough it's, area, um, man. I, I actually went to Harpo's for the first time in my life about a, about two years ago for when my, my label reissued the first Deduce yeah. record, and, and they played, and it was – Interesting experience. Oh my God, I fucking loved Seduce. I loved, was David Black playing? Oh yeah, it was Original Three Guys. Original wow. Three Guys. Mark. You remember? You remember yeah, the yeah. Three Guys? Yeah. And they were a great band. The you first record that you guys put that out? Yeah, and we got, we've got the second record coming out uh, later this year as well. So you you guys are kind of like, a, what's that What's that label? Like Rhino, you're like the De Rhino of Detroit or something. Yeah, Rhino we tried. Motor City, City Rhinos. Harpo's, I'll tell you, the second gig I ever played when I got out of high school was with a band called Tilt. And the second gig I did was at Harpo's. I played yeah. the 24 Carat Club, and then, which is a six mile in Telegraph, which I'm sure is no longer there. I can't be. And Harpo's, and Harpo's was big, right? That's yeah. like, that's a real venue. And I was yeah. scared shitless. And we played with the almighty Strut. Yeah, Strut. With Gunnar Ross as the drummer, had the biggest fucking drum set I'd ever seen at that point. Somehow, a local band, he was he was endorsed by Ludwig. 
And this oh. is 1980. And he had the biggest uh, drums I'd ever seen. And wow. 24 inch kicks for floor. To, I mean, it was, it was, they, yeah. sound, they sounded terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It didn't matter. It was it all matter. break sticks with his head and hit bullets on his cymbal stand. I mean, it was all show. Yeah. And, and Harpo's, and I, I ended, <laughs> I ended up, um, Befriending one of the waitresses. I uh, see you did. Yeah, yes, yeah. Oh, oh. You know, later on, I was 18, and this was like the greatest thing ever. And we were having a, a, an adult hug at the end of the night in the dressing room, and the lights go out, and she and I'm like, "Let's get out of here." And she's like, "Well, they let the dogs out in here." And so you're gonna have to make a run for it in the back door. <laughs> they had two like killer German shepherds. <laughs> I'm what? putting my clothes on. I'm, and then you get to the parking lot. You just don't want to get shot. Or yeah, like three in the morning at 94 in Chalmers. 94 in Chalmers. Do you remember a band called Adrenaline? They used to play at oh. Harpo. Brian Pastoria and oh, the Rodeo. Yeah. Me and Michael. Yeah. They were DC Drive. Yes, those guys were great. Love those guys, man. Yeah, those guys. Hey, Brian. Were... Oh, is Brian on there? I'm not even looking. Oh, cool. George, hey, Tom, Tom, question here right? for you about uh, switching gears a little bit. Uh, Chad wants to. Uh, Bobby wants to ask Chad about. Uh, he was at the Iridium in New York City when you and Ginger Baker came to town with his group in support of the mayor of Mr. Baker. Could you talk about your experience with uh, Ginger? I believe you did an interview with him around that time. <laughs> I did. Well, I don't know if I would call it. It was like, a, yeah, um, I, be, I, be, I, was, I was interviewed for that film, and I became friends with the director. And um, I was living in New York at the time. And Ginger, we didn't even think that he would even be able to play. And all of a sudden, um, my friend Jay Bolger, who was the director, he was like, Ginger's coming to town with a band. I'm like, he's playing? He's like, yeah, I guess so. And I'm like, holy shit, I got to see this. And at the time, I was doing this little kind of podcast slash TV thing. I didn't know what I was doing. But anyway, I was interviewing some people. And I was like, maybe I can talk to Ginger. And he's like, yeah, I'll see if he can, he'll do it. And so we went to see him at the Iridium. And it's a small club in New York in Times Square. And I'm sitting in the audience. And hey, ladies and gentlemen, Ginger Baker, and he comes out, and there's like literally two guys holding him by both of his arms. He's like barely walking, and I'm like, "Oh, this is this is this is not going to be good." Like, holy shit, it's, you know? I'm like, "Oh," and they kind of sit him on the drums, and all of a sudden, when he gets on the drums, it's like the hi hat starts going, chick, 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 chick. and he like. Turned into this like rock ginger baker rip, doing his thing, not like crazy, but like good. I was yeah. really expecting him to be like, oh man, this is a fucking gonna be a car crash. And he was he was very good. And I was like, wow, it's one of those things where you see people and they just can't believe that they're gonna, but when they get on stage, it just they transform and it works. And it's so cool. And I got to interview him afterwards the next day. And he just doesn't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> He's a, he was a crusty curmudgeon. If anybody saw that film, it's exactly how he was. He had to have his Barker Lounge with his sunglasses, nonstop chain smoking. And I maybe got a half hour out of him, and he didn't know who I was. Or we had done a clinic together in London. He didn't remember any of it, where he, like, fell over the drums. And he just, it was just like... It was a nightmare. And Jay was with me laughing the whole time. Just, it was so, I was <laughs> so uncomfortable. It was really difficult. But it's Ginger Baker. It's Ginger Baker, man. Ginger ba you can't, you know, the guy, I believe, personally, I believe. but as a drummer, you know, he changed everything. So changed it all. I'll never forget getting to know him in the 80s and bringing him. He was at Sound City recording with his band. And I was doing an album, and my brother was producing it. And we had Steve Lucas there playing a solo. And so we're listening back, and I said, Ginger, I'd gotten to know him. I was at his birthday party with Myron Grombacher and Mark Cranny. We all became friends. But, you know, with Ginger, it's like 
you never really know. You don't want to say the wrong thing. I bring them over. Hey, we're doing a thing. Check it out. And it was a double bass, kind of a hot for teacher kind of song. And, and he pokes his head in the door and he goes, I don't like metal. Cream was not a rock band. We were a blues band. I don't oh, like yeah. metal. And he just walked him back to his room. Yeah. He, if you say, you know, I mean, you see it in the movie, he just like dismisses Bonham, dismisses Keith Moon, dismiss, you know, if you weren't a jazz, if you weren't, you know, Joe Jones or Elvin Jones or Max, Rose, it, yeah, then he, you, you, you were, yeah. you know, he would, <laughs> Joe Bonham, he couldn't swing a bag of shit, you know, but he, <laughs> he didn't mince words, man, he did but, um, yeah, I mean, it was it was difficult to talk to him, to say the least. But anyway, it was a real honor. But yeah, um, I, can I ask J Jason, when did you start playing with uh, Terrible Ted? Uh, two thousand sixteen, I believe. So you know, this oh, year's wow. going fifth year with him, and just can't, can't ask for a better guy to play with. <laughs> Phenomenal. So you're doing a pie knob, man. DTE, you had your Red Wings jersey on. The American flag back there, you were just wailing, man. Yeah, you know I, always, I always tried. I always try to, to come out with a Red Wings jersey at you know DT shows at the Encore and stuff like that. But um, yeah, you know Ch Chad, he, he Ted's talked many, many, many times about you sat in with them years ago and played Motor City Madhouse, and he's just like, that was the best that song's ever been played. Oh please, <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I, I know Ted a little bit through our mutual friend Sammy Hagar. And so when I started playing with those guys, I became a little more friendly. We were down in Cabo, and we did something in Houston once for the Super Bowl. And I did sit in with them once. We were playing in, like, Spain and we're in the same hotel, and I just, Ted. But, um, yeah, it's just like, I mean, Greg knows, growing up in the 70s, and mid-70s in Detroit, long before you were thought in your dad's loins, that it was Ted Nugent, and Bob Seger all over the radio 24 seven, you couldn't get away from. And it was great. You know, those first three, three to me, those first three Ted Nugent records are, are, are you know, classics and, and classics, classics you so know. Um, but those, but he's, he has, he gets good drummers. So, you know, Tommy. Yeah. You know, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's funny because he he just he he's always had a thing for Detroit drummers. I mean Johnny B and you know and, and you know it, it's just it when I got hey, the Johnny B play with Nugent no yeah he did uh the record before I joined the band he played on most of it no shit but with the blue dress man mm -hmm. you play with Mitch Ryder too Jason yep yeah I've done a few gigs with Mitch over the years and you know it's it's uh it, it's it's crazy because you know there's he, he always talks about how Detroit drummers just have this sound that no one can replicate. And it's it's actually funny because I, Tommy Clifettos was my drum teacher for a time when he was drumming for Ted in the early 2000s. Look at that. Yeah. So it's a, it's a crazy full circle and, you know, but to be with a Detroit legend like Ted and he's playing better than freaking ever right now, so. Yeah. Don't you study with George Dunn too back in Detroit? Yeah, George Dunn, you know, was my teacher for many, many years. He was my drummer. What, 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 what? Didn't he have a shop? Uh, he was. He taught out of Huber and Breeze for years. Okay. Oh, my God. Huber and Breeze. I stole all my shit from that place. Oh, man. Just saying. Yeah, Bill Cairo said to say hi to you. It was his birthday yesterday. I still owe him for some symbols, too. <laughs> the, dark, the drum house. How about Tony Pia? Did you guys know Tony Pia? Played with the Doobie Brothers and Keith Emerson, and he took my place with David Lee Roth years ago. Do you know Tony? He's from Cousin, Ohio, like 13 and Van Dyke or something. What, where was that? 13 and Grossbeck. I don't know. Anyway. Um, well, there, is, there is something in the there is something in the water in, in Detroit. I I I that I'm, was flared. I believe flared. there's something about it. For sure, without a doubt. Our drummers, musicians, anything, whatever. I'm so. I'm sure that Greg will agree with me, and Jason, you're lucky too that you. But you're so young. But like, I'm so glad that I had those formative years, growing up in Detroit with the schools where the music was in the schools, and then right out of high school, all those clubs, and I played for eight years nonstop. Those are my ten thousand hours kind of thing. 
And yeah. I was really fortunate to have that. And, and you know, it's, it's uh, Detroit, man. You know, they work hard and they play hard. Yeah, that's right. Right. And it was, and it was, if you, if you were good, they would let you know. And if you weren't, they let you know that too. Absolutely. And bullshit. And that, we really, I was really, you know, lucky to have that, and I, I and I, and I'm sure, um, you know, it's still it's still the same. I don't know if the, if the scene is that vibrant anymore, and we're all professionals now. We got real gigs, but you know, to go play three sets a night, six nights a week, nothing yeah, cool, I think. I remember, I remember playing a couple of years ago at the Fox with Ringo, and after sound check, I said, Ringo, when I was seven, my dad got tickets, and I saw my brother, and I saw you at Olympia Hockey Arena, number nine, Gordy Howe. He says, is that near here? Let's go. I said, it's all torn down now. It's In America, we te tend to tear down big, you know, yeah. actually, uh, historically yeah. Yeah. big buildings. He said, oh, that's so cool, man. He said, uh, you grew up right near here. He said, there's so much great music that comes out of Detroit. I remember Kobo, we graduated, Warren Mott graduated at Kobo. Really? The first David Lee Roth gig of Eat Him and Smile tour in Detroit. We played Kobo, and I said, this is where our high school graduated, Dave. Yeah. He's like, all right. You know, it was like, <laughs> five, man. Yeah, it's great. It's great. You're doing good work uh, promoting music education and all that. Did you ever think the guy wearing the sock would be sent to Washington to lobby Congress? No, no, I didn't think I'd be wearing a sock either. <laughs> so, can I tell you a funny Chad Smith story that happened two days? Oh, come on! So we're in, we're in my kitchen, and my son's twenty. Two, he goes to Pepperdine. My daughter's 19. She's in college nearby, too. And my son's buddy comes over. And, you know, we're always playing Chad. We're always playing Chili Peppers. And his his buddy comes in, and all of a sudden, Can't Stop is on. And he starts twitching. We're going, what's the matter? Ethan, what's the matter? And he's going, ah. And, it, you know, we're hearing the whole intro, you know. Da -da 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 -da. And he kind of starts twitching. I go, Ethan, what's the matter? He said, my roommate. For four years in college, every morning his, he would wake up at six in the morning to study with. Yeah, I still have that every time I start playing that song. So. <laughs> what a groove! That's, that's my favorite of all your grooves, wow. man. Hey, Greg and Chad, you guys share some other artists in common you played with over the years too. You remember who they are? Ozzy. You played with Ozzy? You did. What I had. I did a thing with Ozzy. It was a covers album. And he said, we're going to do, Chad, you got the Birmingham accent. Let me hear you say, we're going to do the Beatles in my life. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, with the pressure of uh, I, can, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's like doing, you know. <laughs> we're going to do In My Life by the Beatles. in my life. That's right. There you go. So I started playing it. He said, we're going to do it a lot slower. There are plays. What's that? I've heard that version. Good. He's a John Lennon fanatic, man. He no, really he loves the Beatles. That's his favorite thing. That's his favorite. Yeah. What about Fogarty? You guys both Fogarty. heard of Fogarty, right? Yeah. yeah. I hear I he's uh, critical of drummers. How'd it go with you guys? Well, I can, I'll give you my. I'll give you a quick one with me. I don't know when Greg played with him, but I played on the. Um, I don't know even know the name of the record now, but it was in like '94. Yep. Um, oh, blue, blue swamp, blue moon, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had used all these different drummers, like all the top session guys, like this man here, Steve Jordan, uh, Keltner, uh, some yep. of I think some of Jeff's last stuff. Um, you name it, like the top guys. And so the drum doctor, Ross, he asked, or Fogarty asked Ross, who really kind of younger guys that are, you know, very good or whatever. And so he, Ross somehow came up with my name and Josh Freeze and a couple other guys. And he said, you know, I'd like to, I'd like them to come over and play it. So I went over uh, and he asked me, he's like, John Fogarty. I'm like, John Fogarty. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? I grew up on that shit. I would love to. Oh, be great. So I go, Greg, do you know Bob Glub? Bob recommended me to play with John. Go ahead. Yeah, I love Bob. 
put a baseball. Bob must hate us because it was torture. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Bob's playing bass. Fogarty, I show up. I'm kind of nervous. I'm like, you know, this is fucking, you know, this is a big deal. But I come in, and he's Fogarty's banging a note on the piano and wanting Ross to tune the snare to this note, right? I'm and, I'm, sure. and I'm going to Ross. I'm going, okay, that's cool, but he's got to know in about five hits, it's not going to be that note anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> whatever, whatever you want. So right then I was like, hmm. And so we 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 sit down and we Bob sitting there and Fogarty and the three of us and we play this song. I forget the song. It's kind of straight ahead CCR rocker swampy thing. Great. We do it a couple of times. Sounds good. Yeah. He goes, Yeah, it sounds good. Let's do it again. I'm like, okay. Let's do it again. Okay. <laughs> Want me to change anything? No, oh, no, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> And we played it like 17 times that day. And I'm just, you know, you guys know after like the fourth time, you're like, whoa. Yeah. Hey, hey. And, I, and, I, and we finished it. And I said, God, that's great. And I'm like, let's, cool, let's, let's do another one. And Fogarty kept going, no, 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 let's keep doing it. And I, and I think I said something to, like, man, I could do this all day. And Bob goes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. And I came back the next day. Same thing, same song all day long. I don't know if you had the same experience, Greg. What happened with me was I remember Bob saying, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? Because Fogarty's having all these great drummers come in, and he mentioned you and I think Vinny and Jeff and Kenny. Oh, was that record? For that same record. And I just I said, yeah, well, I got to leave at like 7 to go to LAX. I'm leaving town at 7. But he goes, well, we'll just work, you know, for like three or four hours. Okay. So I walk in. I got my stick bag. And I see this guy with his back to me, and he's taking the front bass drum head off of the bass drum. It was like a house kit they had there, or John's kit or something. And I see him turn, and I go, John? John Fogarty? He turns around and goes, hey, man. He goes, I just love tuning drums. I'm like, John Fogarty is putting a new padding in the kick. So the same exact thing. Bob's got his bass on, and John puts his guitar on, and he says, well, this tune's a little bit like, Born on the Bayou. I'm like, yeah, I kind of know that song. You know, okay, so we're going. And again, 15 takes or whatever, and we keep playing it over. And then the last take, he says, now on this take, when we get to the end, like the Stones would do, let's just speed up the end, okay? Let's just spend, I know you got to go to the airport, but just one more take, and we'll speed up the end. So we're playing, and we're speeding up the end. He goes, that's great. All right. I said, I feel so bad. I got to go. I didn't want to leave. <laughs> What about look at their yeah, I mean, yeah. everyone's got a different process, you know, and it was a it was so different than the way that I usually back then certainly, you know. Jason, when you record with Ted, is it live on the floor or do you how does it work? Yeah, it's pretty it's when we did the last record, it was pretty crazy. We did the entire record in five hours. Wow. And, <laughs> yeah. It makes everything sound like a fucking Fleetwood Mac. Like conventionally, I'm a studio player, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's in my wheelhouse. So when he, he gave us these demos, we maybe played them, I don't know, once or twice. And then we tracked him. We were supposed to be in Waco, Texas in, for two weeks. That's the cool studio. What's that? What's that? That's a great, I know that studio out in the desert where Khalid records and Snarky. No. This, this this was a weird, weird, weird setup. It was uh, the owner was the son of Johnny Gimbel, the, oh. the, the the fiddle player. And the studio wasn't really a studio. It was a it was a live room with a control room with a PC. There was no outboard gear. There was no nothing. So they flew all of this vintage Neve stuff from Detroit from the loft and uh, set up all the stuff down there. So it was quick for Ted. And But we were supposed to be down there for two weeks. And uh, <laughs> the plan was track one or two songs a day and then move on to the next, you know, the next day. And you know, we got done with one song. I think we did one or two takes and Ted was like, all right, next, next one. All right, next one, next one. And me and the bass player sitting there like, all right, we're, we're here for two weeks. We just finished in five hours. Now what? <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Great. Like meet the Beatles one day. That's unbelievable. Fantastic. Man. Yeah, super old school. I mean, and you know, he's 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 this old, you know, no no live tracks, no click live. So, and I mean, 
he improvises shit constantly on, on stage. So, you yeah. know, it definitely was in his, uh, in his vein to kind of go that route. Didn't he whip out a bunch of tunes on you on the last tour at the last minute? Like, oh, we're going to add this and oh. change it up every night. With he does that it constantly. We'll, we'll, we'll be on stage and he'll call out a song we haven't played in two years. Wow. You know, and it's like he, he just expects us to do it. And actually, this last tour, he pulled a song on stage that I've never heard before <laughs> and just assumed us to do this. <laughs> so we ended up, we ended up, luckily, luck, luckily, you know, most of the Nugent stuff is, is, has a similar, uh, kind of uh, arrangement so it wasn't too too crazy but you know you, you, don't, you don't have to change you don't have to change notes jason you step stop and start exactly <laughs> yeah. follow, follow him when, when the stop and follow then him. but nugent has the craziest endings no absolutely and you know yeah, I mean, you never, you never know what the hell this guy is going to do on stage because it's, you know, he's so in the moment and he's so in, 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 in sync at that point. You know, he he changes shit constantly, and it's, it, I think it's what makes it fun because, you know, we're not lined to a click. We're not, you know, everything changes every night. Yeah, you play any of those Night Ranger songs? No, uh, no. Just for Christian. <laughs> Kelly, okay. what was his band? Sorry, they. Oh, damn oh, Yankee. Uh, yeah, yeah. Any oh, yeah, Danny Danny Danny. Not, not Night Ranger. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. It was the guy from Night Ranger and, and the guy from Sticks. And yeah, Jack Blades and Tommy Shaw. And, uh, yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. Michael Carvaloni? Michael Carvaloni, yeah. 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 Does he play for Leonard Skinner now? Yeah, she does. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet home, yeah. Alabama. Um, did. Uh, uh, does it ever get weird with you know? I love Ted's music, but the politics and all the other shit is just out the out the fucking crazy to me. So let me tell you, as a fan, okay, showing up to the Canyon Club uh, out in uh, Woodland Hills, where we all, and Greg lives right around the corner from there. We all know it well. But uh, when you go to see Ted out here in California, at least, like you're you're going through a full on protest to get into the uh, get into the venue. I'm like, right. Does that happen a lot, man? Yeah, depending depending on the markets, but honestly, it's not it's not too bad, you know. Um, but you know, the fans are coming to see the music, you know, yeah. and it, and it's and it's kind of funny because I always look at his demographic split three different ways. You've got the music lovers, you've got the hunter lovers, and you've got the politic lovers, you know. So it three completely separate demographics that show up at our shows, and it's you know it's absolutely you know phenomenal. It keeps it you know again interesting. <laughs> Is he still like shooting like? I saw a show at the House of Blues. He got like Janet Reno in the ass or something, and then he had a guy that like actually shook her. Yeah, we we, we don't do none of that stuff anymore. But uh... I was dying. <laughs> Turn him up, God! I swear to God, he had the boner. You know, shit. He he was like, and and he will talk some shit, some serious shit. Anyway. Wait. He speaks his mind and, and doesn't give a shit. <laughs> nope. How about Coney Island? Is Coney Island still there, man? The two different Coney Islands next to each other? Oh, yeah. American and Lafayette. Absolutely. American and Lafayette by Tiger Stadium. Yeah, absolutely. Which one's the best one? Yeah, which one's the best, Jason? Come on. I, I usually go to both when I go down there. You Very know? politically correct. Ah, uh, look at you. Come on. He's 26. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm a Lafayette man. I mean, they're both so different. You know, you got you to you gotta get one of each. They tried that out in L.A. They had, did you ever go there, Chad, off Melrose? They had the Lafayette guy. He no. started, another, it didn't really go over, but it was great for a couple of years. My brother and I used to go down there. How's Matt? Good? Matt's good. Yeah, he's home. He's been, you, did you know Bob Birch at all back in Detroit? Yeah. Bob passed away and when I was our best friend. He was Matt's teacher student teacher on bass and yeah. and he passed away years ago and um Matt said no no I can't play with Elton this is not the way you get a gig when your best friend passes away you know yeah. and anyway he but he uh he, he ended up joining and he's he's been on the road with Elton for like eight years and they're of course home as everybody's home they were in Australia putting all those fires yeah. but I also meet a Matt hey Matt I saw him a couple of days ago. We were in a studio, but we were very socially distant. <laughs> I went in the back door. He went in the front door. 
I played my drum, a couple of tracks for a guy. Uh, he's awesome. He's doing great. Thanks. Oh my God. Hey, God. Greg, uh, can you remind us who you play with again? Yeah. Who's that? Yeah. Guy? Oh, with come here. Ever. We were going to be out in about two weeks. We were going to go on the road with Ringo Starr, my hero. and uh, But we moved it to June of end of May of next year. And then we're also, so he's just my hero and the reason that I play the drums, you know, and uh, just love, I've been working with Ringo since 03 and then the All-Star Band since 08. He's just my hero in many ways, not just drumming, but just the way he lives his life. He's a fitness fanatic. He's going to be 80 years old, July 7th. He's in better shape than anybody I know. Yeah. And I called him last week because I got a call because um, the Eagles were out on their Hotel California tour. And of course it canceled and they rescheduled. And when they rescheduled in September, uh, they started the Pepsi Arena in Denver three nights before a Ringo tour uh, here starts uh, in Canada and Mexico. So anyway, I said, Ringo, I got a call the, from Henley and Irving Azoff to do this gig because Scott Crago's daughter's getting married September 19th. And Ringo said, you go play your drums for those Eagles. I'll see you on the plane on air, Ringo, on Monday morning. And he's just, he's just the best. There's nobody cooler than Ringo. For well, those I'm Eagles, to ask about What's so special about his drumming, Greg? I want to hear that from you. Like, well, Chad nailed it, you know, the swing. And, Chad, I saw your great tribute to Ringo. That was so well done. Oh. Ringo swings, you know. He grew up, uh, you know, in Liverpool. And whether he was, you know, listening to Skiffle stuff or, or the Eddie Clayton Skiffle group that he was in or if it's Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, his stepdad was into Artie Shaw and a lot of jazz and he wouldn't poo-poo Ringo's music and say, oh, don't listen to that. But he'd say, that's cool. Check this out. And he got him into swing. His favorite drummer, Ringo's favorite drummer is Cozy Cole, you know, Topsy. And we play that sometimes. I got a little cornet and I'll jam. We'll play Topsy at sound checks. He loves Cozy Cole. And that swing, that's the same swing, if you think about it, a straight eighth note song like, let me take you down. Strawberry Fields, he's always putting that cool swing in there. So just like Chad said, the swing, you know, the, the British drummers, a lot of them, they just had that great swing. But Ringo's swing, I think, was, was the greatest for a pop rock guy, putting that swing in there. You know, everything he does, he, I just keep, I can't take my eyes off him. He's five feet away. Well, now I guess we'd be six feet away. But he's, you know, he's six feet away, and I'm looking at his snare going, man, don't flam with Ringo. And so it's just the greatest feeling ever to be, you know, they had the headphones on as a kid. You're playing with Beatles songs. All of a sudden, there he is. And he's your friend. And we hang out and we just, you know, it's just a dream, man. It's like a dream come true. Very cool. Somebody posted, a uh, buddy of mine over in Nashville posted the isolation uh, uh, track of him playing. She said, she said yesterday. Isn't that great? me, like, like listening to the, the ghost strokes and the swing and that groove, like, no beat detective, no, no metronome, man. Just, just humanity. Like, and if you saw a metronome, yeah, she said he and Paul. It's right, Paul and Ringo's isolated bass and drum track. If you set a metronome to that, to the eight bar drum solo, tongue in cheek drum solo on the end, it doesn't budge. And he wasn't playing with a click. He's just got that feel. And he always says, "Well, you count the songs off. I got a little Tama rhythm watch there, and I go." Okay, I'll count the songs off, and then I'll turn it off, and we'll just jam. He says, you count them off, because I hate counting songs off. Paul would always count the songs off. One, two, three, four. And I just stared at their butts and see where they're shaking. You know? He said, I hate counting off songs, so you count them off. So I get that tempo started, turn it off, and we just go. And he's a rock. He doesn't budge, man. His groove is just right there, you know. Those old cool guys, man. I mean, one thing that always impressed me about – Neil Peart was they would start a song with the click in these last uh, 20 years or so and the click would go off as soon as the song came in and more than half of those tunes have sequences in them multi-measure sequences that start in the middle of the tune that's hard to do right every night with no click he starts it off in the one tempo and then he knows 45 measures later, it's going to be the same tempo and that that trigger is going, you know, that sequence is coming in because it's all to track. 
you know, some of the keyboard stuff that Getty was doing. I'm like, that just blew my mind listening to his monitors. Like, there's no way. But, he was one of a kind, man. We played it here sometimes in my drum room. And one time he, he said, can we just play in three today? He said, play in three? You mean like waltzes? And so he says, yeah, I want to work on playing three. For hours, we played in three. He was so focused. I never met anybody that was that focused. We went for a boat, le- boat ride on West Lake Lake and the, the ducks and the geese. Well, that's a Canadian this and there's that fish. He's naming the fish. We had a couple of Quiznos sandwiches. I never met anybody that intelligent and that focused. So I believe how that can happen. He probably just practiced. Chris, would you practice like crazy in the drum? Oh, discipline is uh, his middle name, you know. But but he had a profound respect for, for jazz drummers and drummers like Chad who just play the way they play from the heart. And, uh, you know, he always wanted that element in his playing too. And, and it's you know, I love those kind of drummers that just go – searching for that knowledge and that growth their, their whole life, you know. How about uh, Chad on Buddy Rich Birdland, man? That is the Birdland take right there. Yeah, definitely. That is badass, Chad. Dude. I'm going to post that that link in the comments, man. Come so, on, man. I, but you know what, Greg? I had to rehearse it at Drum Channel with with Terry, Neil, um, who That's else? Right. Who was Ken Blackwell? Yeah, and I'm and then, dude, I'm way out of my comfort zone. That shit. No, that, you're not. That, no, I'm telling you, I was like, you killed what? it, and killed it. I'm playing probably twice as hard as I needed to, or and I had no, I was just so like, ah! <laughs> it was so great though, man. That's the best part. And I, and I get done and I get kind of quiet and. I look over, I'm like, I'm not fucking looking over at Neil and Terry or probably like, what the fuck? And Neil comes over and he goes, do you think you could play a little bit harder? (laughs) 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 You know, know, like him, he was like, very dry. Very dry. You know, Terry was like, oh man, and Terry's just loving to death. And he's he's like, dude, you you know, you got, he's so, what a he's just an a amazing person. Yeah. So he's always like giving me so just props all the time. He's amazing. And but it, he's like, Dad, that was a great sound like Tony Williams, isn't that? And I'm like, oh yeah. but Neil, Neil was kind of like <laughs> Tony Williams hit pretty hard, man. I'll tell you that. Anyway, that you know, I mean that Buddy and and Neil. Guys like that, they, there's no, there's, there's, I see you, Don. Don, <laughs> Chad nailed it. I yeah. see he did. you. He did. Unk, my uncle. Um, but love, uh, dude, that was, it was really, that was a really fun thing. And I know, Greg, you've done those Buddy Rich things. And it, what an honor to be part what of it. What an honor for us to get yeah. to play with that band in memory of Buddy. What an honor. And Neil was so great about putting together the Burning for Buddy stuff. And I remember hanging out with him in New York because we did it at the power station. We'd always walk from the hotel to the studio. And he had very strong opinions of different bands. I remember they were trying to figure out which Atlantic band Atlantic would take as an opening act. Two of my favorite bands were on that up for it. And he's like, well, I don't really like this band. I don't really like this band. I'm going, I love both of those bands. Anyway, it was pretty crazy. He opinionated, but he knew what he liked, man. Hey, that's better than, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. It's funny you guys mentioned that. I love it and I hate it over, yeah. Yeah. Remember Um, Neil played a a cut of YYZ that night with the big band? (gasps) He used the the Crotali I keep here on my desk just to. Oh. 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 I'm getting teary. From that concert that night. That was what, 2008, I think? Yeah, man. Oh, no, man. Oh, my gosh. I know how tight you guys were, Chris. I love you so much, man. Yeah, well, I see your Mark Craney uh, bass drum head there in the background. Neil's a big fan of his, too. You when Mark are- Craney was, Mark Craney, for those of you who don't know, was my roommate and my hero. He played on Gino Benelli, Brother to Brother. He played on Jethro Tull's tours and albums, Jean Luc Ponty. And we were roommates. And my buddy Jeff Feynman brought this over a couple of weeks ago. I guess Mark had done this when he was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota in high school. And I remember when Mark was going through his really serious uh, kidney issues and dialysis, and he didn't have much longer to live. And a, a letter came in the mail 
And it said Neil Peart on it. And I'm like, wait a minute, Mark, you got some mail. And he opens it up. And I didn't know that um, he had opened up on one of the rush tours with the band he was in. And he says, can you read it for me? And I read it and I, it says, Mark, in an already hard industry to be going through what you're going through, my my thoughts are with you. And there was a check and it was a check and Mark's eyes bulged out of his head. He's like, Neil, and I, what a gracious guy. Wow. Mark Cranny. Chad, did you know Mark? No, no, I, I don't, unfortunately, no, but I, I know that you're good friends with them. And yeah, that no. brother to brother album, man, those fills and stuff. Amazing. Um, I love those records. Paul, I, and the Pharaoh guys got, and your buddies, Paul and Mark, you turned me on to that brother to brother record. Oh, and Larry Fratangelo. It's, it's right? a single headed Tom sound, right? Right. Single headed Mike from underneath. You ever see Larry Fratangelo speaking in Detroit? I haven't seen Larry in a while. It's been a long time. Unfortunately, I think the last time we, our band played in Detroit, and I think it was 2017, so probably three years ago. Okay, what a great percussionist. Yeah, the best. So he, he was he, in Pharaoh too, right? He Yeah, he taught me so much. Larry was, you know, and, and coming off playing with Dennis and, and, and P-Funk. And, and so I was a 20 year old drummer, you know. Yeah. I was, I was you know, really rough. And he, <laughs> really, he really helped me become, go from a, being a drummer to a musician. Wow. Best way I can put it. Musically. And he was really, uh, he's great. And he, yeah, he played with all, you know, like Aretha and Earl Clue and all the Detroiters. He was kind of the go to percussion guy. And still, um, we play with Kid Rock and some other pieces. He's, 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 you know, he's Detroit all the way. So I love Larry. Yeah. Yeah, man. He's still around somewhere. <laughs> Jason, Kid Rock. Uh, you ever do any stuff with him sitting in? Does he play all the time around Detroit? Uh, not too, not too much. The only thing that I've done with with him was I think it was two years ago. Nugent and Kid Rock did a big, you know, country festival out in the middle of nowhere in Iowa, like 50,000 people or something. But other than that, I haven't really, you know, I know various people that have worked with them and stuff like that. But well, Chad, um, you worked with Kid Rock. I did. I did one of his records. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Man. Yep. And he was my neighbor here in Malibu. He lived on the next street. So I used to see him quite a wow. bit. Yeah. Yeah. He's like the Detroit David Lee Roth to me. <laughs> when I first, you know, fuck, you know, when I first heard is, you know, and I was like, He's got a vibe like Roth, man, but it's like, you know, the Detroit version, you know. Early hey, hey, I'm gonna ask you a question and you and you don't have, you can you don't it's up to you. Now you moved you, you when you got the gig with David Lee Roth, yeah, you Vi, Billy Sheehan, and you're going out on the on on the first tour, and Paul Vent, Paul Vent, I'm eating at some restaurant. And I'm telling you, I am, what year is this? 80 what? 85. 85. The tour was 86. So it must have been 86. And I'm yeah. broke. I got like 20 bucks to my name. And I'm playing Toby Red and, you know, 165 a week. But like, whatever. And I got, I'm like, and Paul, we're having dinner. And Paul's, and I'm like, I, he's like, I'll buy you like a hamburger. Don't worry about it. And we start talking and we start talking about you. And he goes, you know who got the gig with David Lee Roth? I'm like, yeah, I think it's Greg, right? He goes, yeah. He goes, you know how much he's getting paid? I'm like, no, how do you know? He goes, I think he's getting 10 grand a week. <laughs> I was like, what? He's fucking rich. Uh, <laughs> true. Uh, 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 Oh, the greatest thing! I don't even remember what the original pay was. <laughs> to me, do hey, ten grand was like more money. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the best thing about the best thing about Dave, besides just being super generous, was that he would let Steve, I, Billy Sheehan, and I, and him, the four of us, we would write the songs. I'm like, so he's cutting us in for songwriting. Okay. I mean, I'm such a huge old Van Halen fan and a huge Dave fan. I just remember the first time he walked down in the basement where Van Halen used to rehearse, and uh, 
He said, I've been listening to the songs. I was walking around. You know, he has this huge mansion out in Pasadena. I was walking around listening to you, playing these songs. And he goes, how did you learn all these songs? The guys just discovered you yesterday, like Christopher Columbus or something. I said, well, I went to Steve Vai's place, and he gave me a cassette of all the demos. And so I made little charts. He goes, you read music, bro? And I said, what? I make little drum charts. You know, and he goes, who was your last gig? And I said, oh, I'm dead in the water, man. He's not going to. I said, believe it or not. A Gino Vanelli, he goes, Gino Vanelli, Nightwalker, brother, brother. He knew the albums. He goes, what about before that? And I said, well, this big, big Maynard Ferguson, I'm thinking he's going to go, see ya. You know, yeah. jazz. Thing, you know. He goes, Maynard Ferguson, the high note guy, the, the team from Rocky and Herbie Hancock's Chameleon. I'm going, David Lee Roth knows me. And he goes, welcome to the band, bro. Payday starts Friday. Let's go get some tacos. <laughs> and that was it. I love it. I love it. I, I mean, look, I'm friends with Sam and was in a little band with him and, and Michael was in the band. And, you know, I've heard a lot of Van Halen stories and Mike's got them all and he's a classy fucking guy. I never talk shit. Yeah. Sam, you know, has got his version, but I prefer the David Lee Roth years. Hands Me down. Too. Me and too. I think whatever. I know people the, love the best Michael Anthony story. I'm telling you, we're rehearsing because my dad, you know, he bought like his friends bought a thousand tickets to go to Kobo for our gig in 86. And I said, Dave, can we get like a room there to have a bunch of friends before the show? Sure, man. So we had this room stocked. I said, well, all we're from Detroit. Everybody just drinks beer, just beer. No Jack. No, just trust me. They'll drink a lot of beer. So we got a thousand families in Detroit at Kobo and Dave walks by and he goes, they said you guys broke the beer sales record here at Cobo. They drank so much beer, my dad's friends. But we had all these people. So Dave and my dad became friends, and my dad and Dave's dad. So I remember asking him, because I wanted to meet Michael Anthony. And it's like 87, 88. I've been in the band a couple of years. My dad's name's Bud. And here, here's a picture of my dad real quick. I'll just zoom over here. This is Aww. Scott Manel actually took this shot. There's my dad Aww. playing you know, drum oh, and, so, and he anyway, was your tech. He was your tech. He was your tech, right, for 18 years. And my mom played jazz vibes in his band. And my sister, she's in the entertainment industry. Everybody's all musical, right? So Dave and my dad become friends. And I just, I said, Dave, you know, I want to ask you, man, what's Michael Anthony like? I love his playing. I love his singing. And Dave looks at me and he goes, you know, Michael, He's incredible. He's just like your dad, Bud. He's always got a beer for you. He's always got a smile, plays his ass off, sings his ass off. And the fact that he related Michael Anthony to my dad, I'm, I told Michael that, and it was like, wow, that made my, what a great guy he is, huh? He's a Michael. great guy. Great guy. Underrated, you know. Great, um, great. Yeah. Totally. I mean, solid, and his voice, you know, such a huge part of that sound, and high and loud. Like a cannon. Oh. We record background vocals and, you know, gang vocals, and he would have to be like, way Because <laughs> he was just, like, so fucking loud. But like it was, boom. Yeah. Okay. Oh. That Jack Daniels. I wish the original on. band would get back together, but I don't think it's going to happen. That Me Jack too. Daniels uh, bottle on stage you always used to use, was that full of Jack or was that apple juice? Oh, man, no. He loved no, was Jack that. Daniels. Let me tell you. We were, in, we were in Edinburgh, Scotland, and oh. after the show, we had a scotch tasting party. There was a table, like tw two beer pong tables long, every different kind of scotch. And I was like, <laughs> Dave loved his whiskey. We're taking whiskey to the party tonight, and I'm looking for somebody to squeeze. <laughs> <Can you drink? laughs> he's, on t he's opening for Kiss. Isn't that cool? It was. I'll be yeah. Sorry. We'll be again, hopefully. Yeah, I love Dave, man. We did a thing. We almost did a reunion thing at Lucky Strike a couple of years ago. And I said, Dave, you are my musical passport to go around the world. After I got that gig with you, it was, everything was cool. You know, he goes, glad to hear it, bro. He's just wow. a great guy. Hey, Greg, tell us the ticklish snare drum story. The, the, the ticklish? Oh, Ringo? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you guys will dig this. So, Jason, you're probably, I know, I've, I've, I'm way into your playing. I know you know about Rosanna, right? Jeff Percaro, Rosanna. Oh, yeah. Jeff's one of my idols, all-time idols. I figured. Well, you know, there's all the snare in it. And Ringo 
Yeah, I, I kind of re I recommended Luke and Chad. You and I have played a lot with Luke in there. We love Luke, and uh, <clears throat> and we're on an album together. Transition, you and I. That's with right. I did one song on that. You yeah. killed it, man. And we're on Henry Shearer's album together. That was fun. That was super fun. I got to so double team with Keltner on that one. Yeah, man. How cool was that? Oh my god. I'm so gonna, go ahead. So go. Go ahead. Ethan, what what should I play on Rosanna? You know, you recommended your friend Steve Lukather. We're doing Rosanna, Africa, hold the line. He goes, Rosanna, there's all that snare stuff in there, the tickly stuff, like Kristen. What do I do with all that tickly stuff? I said, Well, Ringo, why don't you just have fun and just play? And you know, maybe you, you know, I said, people are coming to see you play. They're not, they don't care if you play the ghost notes. Is that what you call them? Ghost notes? Yeah, they don't care about why don't you just go like he says, you know, I'm not a oh guy so much, you know. I said, why don't you just play to and have fun with it? He goes, is that cool? I'm going, is it cool? It's Ringo Starr and his all star man. Of course, it's cool. And P and man, Luke learned leans around and, and Ringo's playing that song and he's just smiling and having fun playing. He says, what about all that? I said, don't worry, I'll do that. And you just come in on me too. Uh, but Ringo always goes by the vocals. And I told Chris this. He's making a few notes, you know, meet you all the way. And he knows there's a stop there. So meet you all the way. He's just thinking about the lyrics. And Luke had never heard this before. Meet pop. Ringo does a big flam on meet you because it goes through the vocals. Meet you. Oh, and he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. I love that. And, and it's in the act. It's in awesome. the stage. It just fits the song because of the lyrics, you know. He's such a musical drummer. Yeah. There's a fantastic video of you playing with Toto. People want to go to YouTube and check that out. Just uh, Toto, Rosanna, Greg Bissonette. Oh, that thank feel, you. Man, you had that feel so just, you're right in there, man. Why don't oh, you get Jeff a taste? Hero, man. Jeff you give a taste? Hero. I'll never forget going to Perkins Palace to see Toto and Alex and Eddie were there. And uh, we went across the street later to hang out at this bar. And, and, and Jeff just kept saying, there, right there, pointing to Alex. He goes, that's the godfather right there. He, Alex Van Halen and John Bonham. Alex Van Halen is such a great drummer, man. And, and I think being in Van Halen with his brother, Eddie, is and Roth and whatever, but like more Eddie, I think, really overshadowed his drumming for sure. I agree. I agree. I mean, he's a monster. Maybe yeah. that's why people always say he's, you know, one of the most underrated drummers. I'm like, underrated by who? Right. Maybe yeah. compared to Eddie, but not by drummers. Everybody loves Al. I right? think, yeah, I think drummers, yes, but I think in maybe in the more, you know, whatever in the in the yeah in the, in, in, the, in the mainstream of like musicians or whatever. He's yeah. not mentioned up with the Mitch Mitchells and the Keith Moons and and you know. I well, they can they can try to play that uh, bell pattern and uh, hop the teacher. And <laughs> no, kid, but, 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 I'll never forget Dave. I had my kid down in his basement, and he goes, "Why are your bass drums so short?" Said, <laughs> these, these are the new twenty four by eighteens. He goes, "Alex Van Halen's were twice that long. How are you going to play a drum solo standing on your drums like I was talking about?" <laughs> he thought that was normal. <laughs> the, the big. You know, cones coming out, the stereo cones coming out. He was a game changer, Alex, man. I loved it. I was always looking forward to, like, what kind of drum set is he going to have on this tour? It was so great. He always yeah. had the coolest shit. Was it the black uh, Vista Light candy cane uh, black white kit that had uh, one of those bass drums was a refrigerator, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, I that from he had, a, he had a, a co like a speaker cone. Yeah. yeah. Big speaker wedge. Yeah, I always thought like the he had fire extin. Who? What a fucking badass has fire extinguishers on his drums. God, yeah, come on, come on. Refrigerator for Colt forty five, right? Maybe the guy who has the helmet with the flame out of the top should have one of those on his. Yeah, screen, who, right? what do you think of that guy? Could he use that extinguisher? But like, I just and it said like flammable or something on his. I was just like, come on. Oh. anyway, um, good stuff. Fellas, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to pay you for overtime if we don't wrap this up, man. What a blast this is! What a ball! Thank you so much for spending the time with us. I uh, hope people had a great time watching. Thank you very much to our guests, Jason Hartless, Chad Smith. Love y'all, Greg. Why don't you play us out with a little Rosanna? 
Jason, nice oh, to meet you. Yeah, good. likewise. Or we could do a little bit of this. Dancing to get every one of them for hours. Yeah, that every day on his Instagram, man. You too. I know. I gotta quit doing that yeah. shit. I'm running out of fucking beats. <laughs> no, you never run out. I'm running out of beats, man. <laughs> man, your snare drum on that song. I told my son the other day. I said, "Listen to the way that snare drum is just tank, tank, tank. The best." Jason, thank you for putting this together. What a great idea you had about doing the Detroit Drummers Roundtable. And we've got a little Grand Rapids stanky in there. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's been fun, guys. Thank you all. Chris, you're the the million. Be safe, be healthy. We'll see you soon, one way or another. And do the stanky leg. (laughs) Chris, thank you.